It's right on Scott's Corner Road. And it's pretty much open seven days a week. There was a period of time during the pandemic that uh, the hours were really cut. But um, at any rate, things are getting a little bit back to normal. And it's a great place to go for a hike or bird watching or in the wintertime even there's lots of bird feeders and things like that. So um, let's go ahead and find out what do you need to watch birds. So obviously you need an interest in nature, which I think um, a lot of people have been discovering nature during the pandemic. They've been stuck at home and looking out their windows and saying, what is going on in my backyard? Good observation skills um, are, are always a help with trying to find where birds um, are in your yard or in a tree or in a lake, something like that. And also good binoculars and good field guides. And we're gonna talk about different kinds of binoculars and different kinds of field guides. And I'm hoping that this will get you started in the right direction. So let's start with binoculars. And this is a Vortex binocular. Uh, this is the sort of uh, common looking binocular these days um, versus those big old clunky ones they had back in the uh, 60s and 70s. And it's an eight by 42, which means the magnification is eight and the field of view is 42. And years ago for $200, you got a really crummy binocular. But now um, the technology has become so advanced and um, the, uh, Mech, the manufacturing of them has become advanced and it's allowed better lenses to become more affordable. So the other thing that was a problem, let me see if I can find my arrow, there it is. Um, in the old days, if you wore glasses, it was very hard to get a binocular that um, you could see well with. And so instead of having these fold down cups, which they used to have these rubber things, and then you would fold them down, they now have these little screw things up on that and then you can adjust them. And then that will help you get better vision. And then this knob here is what helps you with focusing um, if let's say you don't wear glasses so sometimes each eye is a little bit different. Most people who wear glasses, they, the doctors try to get you 20-20 in each eye. So you can just usually set this to zero. But if your vision is a little different in eyes, you can, you can change that. I'm not gonna go into how to focus your binocular or anything like that. Um, there's a million YouTube videos and um, papers on how to do it. Um, it's a little hard to do online. It's better to do it with a person. So um, we're just gonna sort of skip that part today. And um, as I said, uh, I found this one at uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. And um, that one, this one is only $219. So the next one I wanna show you is a Nikon. Nikon is another brand. Um, and this was, again, it's, you can see it's very similar to the, in terms of shape to the other one. And this one was at B&H Photo for $276. And then if you want can to you go up to notch, you can go to the Zeiss Terra, like the video. which is Your side, $499. Side. So... Um, no. For 500 bucks, you can get a really good binocular. But if you, if that, at some point, if you really get into this, you might want to even go higher up. So um, other well-known brands of binoculars are the Zeiss, the Leica, and Swarovski. And you will notice these are all European brands. And Zeiss and Leica also make microscopes and very uh, technical equipment. So they've been in this business a very long time. So you can get uh, a 
binocular from anywhere from 500 and you can go as high as $2,800. So it's, it's pretty crazy, but for starters, as I said, you can get a decent one for about 200, $250. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about field guides and field guides are really important to helping um, identify birds. A um, hundred years ago, the way they used to identify birds was with a shotgun. They just go out, shoot something, and then take it and, and identify it and bring it back to the lab and they would stuff it. And so that's how you have some of these museum co collections. Um, also then when they were identifying these birds, they had the birds in hand so they could observe these minute details on birds that you wouldn't really see if you were just looking across the field to a bird. And I'll give you an example of one of those later. Um, I think the best field guide for starters is the Peterson's Field Guide and it focuses on the Eastern US. And Peterson was the basically the grandfather of modern day birding. He was the first one to come out with a field guide and he would put these little helpful arrows at, on the pictures of the birds um, to show you field marks that would identify them. And he was an incredible artist and he drew all his own plates in, in the books. The other bird that is very helpful if you're beginning is the birds of New Jersey. So it has only birds that happen that occur in New Jersey. And it's not, um, the field guide, the normal field guide is based on families and evolutionary development. So that's how the birds are grouped. In the birds of New Jersey, the field guide is done by color. And so you would pick the major color of a bird and flip through and you would be able to find it. This is really good for kids because it allows them to help to find things quickly. And I also um, find that it's, it's really good when you're just starting out. Um, because it has good photographs of the birds. And it will also say in there maybe, oh, um, this one is similar to XYZ bird and you can go and compare. So then the other thing is Merlin is a free app that is from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And um, you can just download it. And um, it is um, a very good way to look up birds if you're, you know, just have a question and you want to look them up. Um, I would not use it. They, they have a um, part of their field guide on this Merlin. They have a thing where you can put in what the size of the bird is, the color of the birds and things like that. And it will supposedly ID the bird for you, but don't count on that. The technology hasn't quite gotten that far. It's not very good. You really do need to figure it out on your own. So on um, the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, if you were also to Google them, they have an entire website devoted to um, identification of birds. It's basically a field guide that's online. Um, and it's, it's called All About Birds. And uh, you can look up all sorts of information about every single bird. The nice thing about the Merlin app is that if you were to go out of the Northeast, you can download, let's say you went down to Florida, you could download a, um, a package of birds of the Southeast. Or let's say you went to California, you could do the same thing. You could download a package of um, birds that are in California or the West Coast. So um, it, the nice thing about Merlin is it's very portable, um, but I find um, that really to learn about the birds, reading the book and um, doing things with a book in hand is also very helpful. So, okay, so the next one is um, how do you identify a bird? So there's many different things that come into play. Um, a big part is song. Birds all have their unique way of vocalizing and singing. 
And they're all different, although some may sound a lot like the other, but they are different. You can go by the shape of the body, the wing, the bill, and the tail. So if you were to look at a duck, you know it has that big flat bill and they swim in the water, as in how does it behave? They're a swimming bird. And then the other question is, where are you? Are you in the woods? Are you in the city? Are you in a marsh? Are you at the beach? Or are you looking on a river? Because birds have evolved to occupy different habitats all around the world. So a bird that you would normally find in the woods, you are not gonna find in the marsh. So there, um, it's helpful when you're looking, when you're in a habitat to think, about the kind of bird that would be there. For instance, you're not going to find a duck in the woods. I mean, that's a very obvious um, comparison, but that's where you think, you know, you're not going to find a duck in the woods. And then the other thing is how does it fly and how does it swim or how does it wade in the water? You have great big herons that will just wade into the water. Ducks always swim. Um, and certain birds have very identifying flight and the way that they, they fly. For instance, woodpeckers always fly like this with a dip. So when you see a bird going by like that, you can, you can say, oh, maybe that's a woodpecker. And then the other good thing you can do is with your binoculars, this is where the binoculars come in, you look at their color, whether they have an eye stripe or a ring around their eye, a different color, whether they have wing bars. A lot of birds have different colors on their wings and also their tail pattern. So um, for instance, many hawks have stripes on their tail um, and some birds um, will have a different color wing bar, usually like it's a whiter color or um, not a contrasting color, but just more like a white on a gray or black on a white, things like that. Okay. So the, um, in the bird world, this learning to identify birds by using all these things is called getting the jizz of a bird. So it's the general impression of the bird. You know, is it a big bird? Is it a small bird? Is it is it got long wings, short wings? Look at the size and look at the shape. Because if you think about how birds present themselves, they have definite silhouettes. And this is an example. This is taken from the Peterson Field Guide. And you can see all these different silhouettes of different kinds of birds. And because I've been doing this for many years, let me find my arrow here, I can recognize many of these birds without having to look at the list on the side. And for instance, let's go to number nine here. I know that's a mockingbird because they have really long tails. They love to sit like that. They have a pointy beak. If you look over here at the three, 18, 19, and I guess it's, 20, these are all swallows. Swallows have that, that very particular silhouette. Their wings always extend beyond their tail. And then let's look at another one, number 12. This is a woodpecker. Woodpeckers always sit up straight up on against a tree or up on a, a stump. And they have that big beak and they're always using their tail to prop up themselves. And then I'm sure you've seen many pictures of pheasants, and this is a picture, this is a silhouette of a pheasant. So these are birds that occupy fields and uh, trees and will sit on the wires. A lot of birds will sit on the wires and driving by, you can see them. Another one that's very local and familiar is the morning dove. And he has a very long tail. He's sort of got a round body, things like that. So this is, and in the Peterson guide, he has silhouettes for birds that this is the sort of 
farm and tree and wire one. He has one for wading birds, so like herons and um, and ducks. And so he has different silhouettes and well, it will help you learn that. And an, exa an example of this is, um, let me find it, here it is, the robin. That's a very common bird. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen robins on your lawns, on other places' lawns, and you drive by and you know that's a robin because you've always seen that profile and you've seen it running across the lawn and it's it's that dark gray color with that red breast and you in your head you just go that's a robin and those are the things that will become natural to you once you start doing birding more often so now we i talked about how field guides are organized into families and so birds have evolved, different families of birds have evolved over time to occupy different habitats and niches in the world. And a lot of it has to do with what they eat or where they nest or um, how they move around. So as you can see, there are plenty of, of birds here. So we have a mallard duck up here. So he's obviously in the duck family. We have a ring-billed gull. Gulls tend to all look very much, very similar. Um, the mature gull is usually white and gray with some black on it. You have hawks. This is a red-tailed hawk. And you see them soaring around. And hawks usually have these beaks with a hook on it and they have massive talons because they're predators. And here's that woodpecker that we were talking about. You can see how he's He's perched leaning up against um, a log and that's another family. And then here's the blue jay. He's also in another family, called, he has the jay family. Here's the chickadee. The chickadee and the titmices are all together. And then up on the right is the goldfinch, the American goldfinch, which happens to be the New Jersey state bird. And yes, they're all around. And then below that is a cardinal. And if you look at the difference in the beak between the cardinal and the goldfinch, they both are seed eaters, but look at the size of the beak on the cardinal. It's huge. He can crack those really big sunflower seeds. Whereas the goldfinch, he can only eat the smaller seeds. So that's their niche that they have evolved in. And then we have our favorite robin and they eat a lot of insects and, and worms and things and feed those to their babies. And then we have sparrows. And sparrows in the birding world are also known as little brown jobs because sometimes they're really hard to identify. This happens to be a song sparrow. It's very common in New Jersey. The other really pretty yellow bird that we have that comes to New Jersey is a yellow warbler. And Warblers are what are called neotropical migrants in that they come to the North American continent to breed and in the wintertime they go to Central or South America and we'll talk a little bit about that. So here we go. Here are woodpeckers. I'm going to give you three examples of different families. So here we have woodpeckers and as you can see they all sort of are um, up against the, the bark. If you look at their feet, they have two toes that go forward and two toes that go backwards. And this helps them climb up the tree. They have very stout beaks. The downy, pro the one on the right is a downy. He probably has the smallest beak of all of them, but they use for drilling into trees and making cavities for nesting and also looking for insects. They eat primarily things like larvae, grubs, ants. So they're always drilling into dead trees or things. So this is called the red-bellied woodpecker. Now, when you look at that, you're going, where's the red belly? And this is an example of how 100 years ago, they had the bird in the hand and they were able, they identified it because during the breeding season, the bird has three or four red feathers on its belly, <laughs> but 
it really doesn't have a red belly, uh, you know, in, in the general sense of the term. So many people, when they see this bird, they call it a red-headed woodpecker, but that's an actual different woodpecker. The red-headed woodpecker, his entire head, it, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Whoops. Um, his entire head is red. This is called the red-bellied woodpecker, okay? The one on the left is called a northern flicker. And this bird is a little bit larger than the other woodpecker and has a really massive beak. And they're actually their favorite food is carpenter ants. So um, they're you find them a lot in woods, especially damp woods, because carpenter ants like damp woods because they like rotting wood. And then the little downy on the right here is sort of what everybody's little backyard woodpecker. Um, and they eat a variety of different things. Again, they're drilling into things looking for insects. So when you think about woodpeckers, oh, the one other thing I didn't mention is look at this downy's tail. See how it has these little points on the bottom? And then look at the tail over here, the same thing. That tail is very stiff and almost has barbs at the end of the tail. So it helps support them when they're climbing up and down the tree. So these are all the things that make a woodpecker a woodpecker. And when you see that shape and you see it climbing up a tree, that's one of the things you can say, oh, that must be a bird in the woodpecker family. Now that'll help you because then when you go to your field guide, you can go directly to the woodpecker section and look up woodpeckers and I bet you would find your bird. All right, let's go to a different family. So here we have thrushes and all these three birds are all found in New Jersey. The robin that we've talked about, the American robin is, a, is in the thrush family. And again, if you look at these birds, look at their body shape, look at their head shape, and, and look at their beaks and they, they look fairly similar. And thrushes have these nice big brown eyes. So they're, they're always looking very alert. And um, so the American robin is the most common. The bird in the middle is the wood thrush. So you won't find him if you don't have any woods. Um, he likes to nest in deep woods and he has an absolutely gorgeous song. He's my favorite bird. His song actually sounds like a flute. And so when we're done here, go look him up online and, and listen to his song. It's very ethereal. And he always comes back from, he goes down to um, Central America in the winter and he always comes back the first weekend in May. And I can't wait to hear his song when he comes back. The bluebird, is another thrush. This is one of the few, um, the only thrush that I know that will actually is a cavity nester and they will nest in bluebird boxes. And their habitat of cavities was um, lost over many, many years because people were cutting down dead trees. And also because the starlings and the house sparrows, which are also cavity nesters, but are not native to the United States, had come to America <coughs> and were taking over their nesting spots. Excuse me. So someone had the great idea of building a bluebird box and putting it up. And now that has really helped the bluebirds come back. And what they love, they love those suburban lawns. And they like them, the ones that are surrounded by shrubs and woods on the side. And they'll sit in a tree branch or a shrub and they'll look down the grass. And when they see a moth or something fluttering, they'll, they'll fly down to the grass and, and get it. So much like the robin runs around the lawns, they like to perch and then and look for their prey. And the wood thrush, again, is looking for things like different insects in the wood, in the woods. So um, that's the thrush family. There are other members of the thrush family. These are the three that are pretty common in New Jersey. 
So now we're going to move on to a third different family, and this is the finch family. So we have both these finches, the American goldfinch, as we talked about, and then the bird on the left is the house finch. Now the house finch was originally um, only found on the west coast. And how he got to the east coast is um, probably 50 years ago, um, people were capturing them in California and bringing them to New York City to sell as a cage bird. Because 100 years ago and even today, people wanted pets that would sing and they have a beautiful song. So these birds escaped from their cages in New York City, you know, down in, in probably the market down on the bottom end of, of town. And they liked it here and they started breeding. So now we have house finches everywhere. I didn't really start seeing house finches um, in great numbers until probably in, in the mid 80s. So when I was growing up, I didn't have a house finch. And, and then in the 70s, they really started to take off. Now, I'm gonna show you two other things that are an additional thing you need to know when bird watching is that there are some species where the male and the female look alike, but in many other species, the male and the female look different. So you have the male house finch here and you have the female house finch here. You have the male goldfinch and you have the female goldfinch. And if you think about it, which bird has to sit on the nest and take care of those babies and be, try to be camouflaged? So basically that's what the females do. The, in, this, in the species where the sexes are different, the, um, the females are usually more drab color. So in the bird world, it's usually the guys who get to wear all the fancy dress, okay? They, get they have beautiful colors, they have a wonderful song, and the females are sort of quiet and, and they, some of them do sing, but not necessarily as well as the males. And they're the ones that are building the nests and having the eggs. And hopefully in most species, the male will help with raising the young, but there are some where they don't. So that's an example of three different families of birds. And again, um, you might see a bird that you think looks like a fish, but it's a finch, but it's this brown drab color. And in the winter time, the female goldfinches are even more drab because there are also birds that change plumage at different times of the year. So in the winter time, the male goldfinch looks like the female goldfinch because he loses all his bright colors and becomes dull and drab over the winter. And then in the spring, he molts and he gets new, new feathers and he gets new colors. So in addition to looking at size, shape and, um, and song and, and other things, there are certain species where the male and the female look different. And as you come to do more birding, you will find to learn which species where they, they look different. For instance, jays look alike. They, blue jays, male and female look alike. Um, in the wood thrush, male and female look alike. In the uh, robins, the look alike, but you can tell a male because he has darker feathers on his head. His head feathers are more black than gray, but it's very subtle and you have to have, have to really look at it to see that. So there's a lot of different things that you need to know about birds, but um, to correctly identify them. But it, again, it's something you can learn. And especially with many ducks, the females all look the same. So it's much easier to identify the males and ducks and because they have specific plumages and it's much, much easier. So a lot of birds seem to say, okay, well, I know that's a female mallard duck because the male's swimming right next to it. So those are a pair. So um, that's, the, uh, that's another thing that you can do with bird watching. 
Um, all right. Now, what happens? Where do some of the birds go in the winter? Sometimes, not all the birds stay here during the winter because it gets very cold, it freezes, and many, many birds have insects as their food. So those birds that eat predominantly insects have to go somewhere where it's warm to find their, their food. And then other times they'll just, um, sometimes they can just move maybe a little bit, you know, move from North Jersey to South Jersey. Um, there are some swallows that <coughs> um, tend to hang out in Cape May all winter if it's a mild winter. But this is what we're talking about with migration. So here we have a map of the United States and we have this yellow warbler, which is known as a neotropical migrant. And the reason for that is they spend half the year down here, actually more than half the year, and only come up here to breed. So the, the orange is their breeding range the yellow is where is where you would see them in migration and the blue is where they would winter and then you also have um non-breeding or a rather year-round range which is purple and those are the caribbean islands and a lot of things like to go to the caribbean islands in the winter including people so so this is when you people talk about migration, this is what it's all about. It's it's the abundance of food, um, and the ability to have enough food to have a nest and raise young. And somewhere over millions of years of time, these birds that originated in Central and South America figured out that if they came to North America, that there would be millions of insects every summer for them to feed on and that they could feed their babies. Do you know how in the spring when the oak trees just start to leaf out, there's lots of little tiny green caterpillars and sometimes they come down on strings and they, you know, you'll walk into them, you'll find caterpillars everywhere and birds love caterpillars. Insects are extremely high in protein and if you're a bird and you're hatched from the egg, you have to grow up and get feathers and be able to fly within two weeks of hatching from that egg. So they need a lot of protein and insects provide that protein. So this is the yellow warbler is an example of a bird that goes south for the winter down to, to Central America. And then let's take another example. This is the dark-eyed junco. Now the dark-eyed junco, it has a common name called the snowbird because we only see it in New Jersey in the winter time. Because as you can see, it breeds way far north up in Canada. And they actually do breed in, um, I don't, I'm not sure why this is purple because they, I think some do stay there, but they, but from Maine, I know my sister lives in Maine and she says they leave in the winter time. And to give you a funny story, we grew up in Maryland, which is you know another state south from us. So we always had juncos every winter. And then my sister moved to Maine. And the first winter she was there, she called me and she says, I don't know where all the juncos are. And I said, because they're all down here in New Jersey. She didn't realize that they actually bred in, in Maine, but they left town to get away from that cold and come down to New Jersey. So um, robins can do this too. The robins that, a lot of people say the, the robins leave here in the winter time, but they don't really leave, if you will. They, they move, they move farther south. So if you're walking in the woods, you will see robins in the winter time. And in the winter time, robins will eat berries. So the birds that we see in the winter, the, the winter robins are actually the ones that are coming down from Canada. And the birds that we see here in the summertime are the ones that have come back north from the south. I have a cousin who lives in Florida and in Tampa, Florida, and she says that they know winter is coming when all the robins arrive. 
So there are huge flocks of robins that go to Florida and spend the winter in Florida. So that's, that's an example. These are two examples of migration. And you know, depending on the time of year, it will depend on whether you do see a bird or not in New Jersey. And then here's another bird, the cardinal, that actually spends its whole life in one place. And uh, as you can tell from the map, um, it's pretty much an East Coast bird and or east of the Rockies rather. And um, it is a bird that will hatch and grow up in within a couple miles of its nest and stay there the whole time. And these birds do not migrate. They are able to feed their babies insects in the summer due to that big honking bill they have. They can crush um, seeds and they will eat berries in the winter time. And the cardinal is also an example of a bird where the male is very brightly colored and the female is more drab. But if you ever get a look at a female cardinal, she is really beautiful. So the interesting thing about cardinals is, as I said, I grew up in Maryland. I had an uncle that was from North Jersey. And when he would come down to visit us at Thanksgiving or Christmas, he would be so excited to see the cardinal because in the 1960s, the cardinals were not in New Jersey. And what has happened that with all the bird feeding that has gone on since the 1960s, the range of the cardinal and the red-bellied woodpecker has expanded because they're being provided winter food and they're allowed to get through the winters. And now, of course, we unfortunately have climate change where the winters aren't as bad as they used to be and you're not going down to very low temperatures, which again, also enables these birds to make it through the winter. Um, you'll see in, in on this map, again, my sister lives in Maine and she very rarely sees a cardinal, but one winter she had a cardinal uh, in her backyard and she kept it alive with all those bird feeders she had. So there we go, that's that. And um, in summary, I just wanna say to look around you, look for the birds you see every day and learn them. Because once you learn those common birds, then you'll see something you don't know and you can go, oh, wait a minute, I don't know what that is. Let me look for it. Look up their names, look up their lives, see what they do, where they live, where they go, and definitely have fun. Now, the other thing I want to give you are two um, local organizations. The Plainsboro Preserve, which is obviously in Plainsboro, on, on Scott's Corner Road. And um, you can go there and bird watch. They have trails. Um, they do um, have occasional uh, bird watching trips on the trails, um, but you'd have to go to the New Jersey Audubon website or give them a call. The other Audubon um, group in New Jersey that's local is the Washington Crossing Audubon. And they're more out of the, um, the Trenton, Lambertville, Mercer County area. And they do almost weekly walks. And if you go to their website, they will um, list when their walks are going to be. And when you get there and you, you, you introduce yourself to people and say, hey, I'm new at this and show me what I'm, you know, so I can learn. Because if you don't tell them you don't know what you're looking at, they may think you do do know what you're looking at and they just go, oh, well, that was a chickadee and keep going. <laughs> so the other thing is um, the Washington Crossing Audubon is a chapter of National Audubon and National Audubon has chapters all over the United States. There are some states that have their own Audubon societies, New Jersey being one of them. So New Jersey Audubon Society is not affiliated with the National Audubon Society. The, um, another state that has their own is the Maryland um, Ornithological Society. 
and another big one is Massachusetts. And these are states that started as they were called then. And other states have had small groups and then they join together and join National Audubon. You go to the National Audubon website, you can join them to become a member, you can join New Jersey Audubon to become a member. And what's nice about these um, organizations is they don't do only bird watching. They do a lot of conservation work. And along with the Cornell Ornithology of Laboratory of Ornithology, um, They've really learned a lot over the years, especially now with the technology that is available. Things that were written by hand and then mailed in to you know, document observations and things have, are now being done by computer and cell phone photographs and things like that. So that's sort of the end of my presentation. And what we'd like to do is, I guess we'll take people, let me stop sharing so I can see everybody or see your names at any rate. Um, and if you have any questions, um, do you want, I don't know how they do, you might want to unmute people, Sharon, um, so people can ask some questions. Oops, let me see. Mm. Or you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Unmute yourself and raise your hand and and we'll do it. I did give you a lot of information, but I hope it can get you started in, in what I find to be a very rewarding hobby. Oh, Sophie's raising her hand. Go ahead, Sophie. Can you unmute yourself? Here we go. Sophie says, thanks to COVID, she's now fascinated with bird watching. And yes, so many people have um, started looking at birds in their backyard and feeding birds and all different things and um, connecting with nature because pretty much for the last year, the only thing that we've been able to do is go outside. We haven't been able to go to the mall to go shopping or even go to work um, or go to movies. So. The entire world has discovered that there is an outdoor place for all of us. So, all right. Do we have any other questions? Oops, wait a minute. All right, we have a couple thank yous. If somebody asked me to be unmuted, <laughs> Well, you are on mute, Gabriella. You want to talk? No, I'm Moxie. I'm just oh. Gabriel's computer. Oh, I see. Okay. Do you have a question? No, but why did you ask me to unmute? <laughs> oh, I think she was just doing. Sharon was doing it for everybody. Correct. Uh, <laughs> okay. So so do you have a monthly meeting or seminar or something? Um, no, the Washington Crossing Audubon Society does. They have a monthly meeting and they usually have a guest lecturer. And um, as I said, they also do field trips and they meet in Pennington. Um, there's a school right in downtown Pennington that they meet at. And there's like an auditorium there that they use. And then the New Jersey Audubon Society, we, they also have walks and things like that, but not so much in this area, it's in other parts of New Jersey. And um, every spring and fall in Cape May, they have a big birding festival. And actually in the fall, that's a really good place to go to buy binoculars because all the different people who manufacture binoculars are there. And you can walk around and try out all the different binoculars and see which one fits your face the best. Um, and it's a three-day program. They have lectures, they have bird walks, and um, lots of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is Sophie. I, I, yeah. I have a question. How long can a bird fly without taking a break? And how high do they fly? How, can, how high can they fly? They can fly very high. Um, there are some birds 
that will actually migrate from Central America to the United States um, and go right over the Gulf of Mexico without stopping. Anytime a bird goes over water, they can't stop. Um, and it could take them a couple of days to cross the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there are other birds who will, on their migration south, will come down from, let's say, the coast of Rhode Island. And instead of going down through the country, they'll just go, there are these warblers. Some of these warblers have incredible um, flying times and they will just fly straight to the Caribbean and not stop. Uh, there are a lot of these smaller birds like warblers and thrushes and things will migrate at night because at night the winds are calmer and the predators aren't around. And by predators, I mean hawks. Um, and the uh, other birds that tend to fly long distances are things like terns and gulls. Um, there are some that are known as what they say long distant migrants whereas they, they will just fly. And as far as how high they fly, um, there's actually a program <coughs> in New York City. I don't know if you know, like every, um, every year around September 11th, they have these moonbeam lights that shoot up from where the World Trade Center used to, to be. And what happens is the birds are attracted to the lights. And every time there's a certain number of birds, they shut down the lights because the birds are seeing this light from far away. Um, you've heard of airplanes getting hit by birds with um, geese and um, even um, small birds also. So they can go pretty high. It is absolutely amazing. And Heidi, we have in the chat, um, oh. does birds sleep? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, ducks, are, it's funny because some birds can sleep with half their brain. So especially things like ducks, um, they, they sleep on the water a lot of times and they're always worried about predators. So if there's a group of ducks, the ducks on the outside only sleep with one half their brain. The ducks on the inside can go to sleep with both brains, with both sides of their brain. Um, but birds like chickadees and robins, yes, they, they sleep and they do what, what all birds do. They tuck their head under their wing and, and they do sleep. They may not sleep for as long as say you and I would, you know, eight hours straight, but they do sleep. And are any birds vegetarians? Yes, um, a lot of the ducks actually eat plant matter um, that they dread, they you know die for in the ponds. Uh, things like geese are vegetarians. You always see them out in the fields in wintertime. They're eating the corn. Um, and other than that, I'm trying to think. I think most of the other um, birds either eat insects, berries, fruit, or they are predators on other birds. And so a hawk will eat a bird if he can catch it. And do birds mate only with their own kind? Technically, yes. <laughs> um, but there are some species that are very closely related. So, for example, the northern flicker on the East Coast, he used to be called the yellow shafted flicker. And on the West Coast, there was the red shafted flicker. And um, what you would see is that if you took very close looks at their, their wing and their tail feathers, the shaft of the feather, the part where the little feathers come off was actually yellow or red. So where their ranges overlap in the middle, they can interbreed. So they are the same species, but a different version. And 
do they stay with the mate for the season? Many birds will do that. They will stay with the same mate with this for the season. And um, usually the birds that mate for life are, are things like the longer lived birds, things like geese will, um, whooping cranes will mate for life, um, hawks will. However, if their mate dies, um, they, they don't mourn very often. They just sort of go off and find somebody new. And um, the, the famous ones that are known for mating for life are the storks in Europe. And the storks in like the Netherlands will fly to Africa for the winter and come back. And they are known to come back and nest in the same spot on the same roof of a house because they, they adapted to, to nesting on roofs of the house and with their same mate and that they even wait for their mate to come back. So let's see, ducks and geese poop a lot, they sure do. Um, unfortunately, the ducks eat grass and I'm, I'm not, geese mainly are the ones that we're talking about here. The geese, the Canada goose eats grass. So anywhere there is grass, he's going to go. They love golf courses. They love anything where there's a pond surrounded by grass. Um, and it is pretty hard to keep them out of an area once they've decided to go in. Um, and there are, there's, there's been an attempts at different ways to get rid of them. Some people have put down a chemical that they supposedly don't like the smell. Um, some people have tried using, um, they've actually, there was a company that had border collies and would go out to all the big corporate areas where the ponds were in the geese and would chase the, the geese off the lawn. But there's not much you can do about it. And um, unfortunately, I don't know what else I can tell you on that one. And then how do the animals know their roots? Well, this is very interesting too, that things like geese, the young learn their migration route by traveling that first time with a family group. So they go as a family all together. On the other hand, you have things like warblers that once they grow up and, and leave the nest and usually the parents feed them for a couple of weeks and then that's it, they, they all separate and it has been hardwired into their brain over thousands of years that they know where to go. And it's just, um, it's something that the navigation of how they do it has not yet been figured out. So that's, uh, that's very, that's actually, it's a really good question. Um, and I don't know if you remember, well, it depends on how old you are. I guess I'm old enough to remember. Um, the whooping crane um, who goes to very Northern Canada to breed in the summer and then goes south to the southwestern United States for the winter time. And they um, actually, these birds learn from their parents. So there was a time where they were trying to breed whooping cranes in captivity because they had plummeted to something like 20 in the whole world. And because people were killing them for their feathers and things like that. So they actually had to teach the whooping cranes how to fly and to learn the route because they didn't have parents because they were raised by people. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's sort of one of those trivial facts. I think I got everybody's questions. Anything else? Those were great questions. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like Heidi, you've answered every one question and uh, a great presentation. I want to thank you. I think we learned a lot. Um, I just have one, if you have time. Sure. Um, 
when it comes to binoculars, I saw the price range for mm -hmm. all of them that you right. have presented. As a beginner, can you recommend, what would you recommend? Like say if I wanted to go out and buy some binoculars, but wasn't sure that I was going to continue to right. do this. Right. The ones that I, well, the other thing to remember about binoculars is you can use them not only for bird watching, um, you can take them anywhere. Um, you can, when you go hiking, I take them to, bur to baseball games. It's great. You know, you okay. look at the outfielder and you know, he's scratching his nose, <laughs> things <laughs> like that. Um, you know, you go, if you go into New York city and you go up the empire state building, it's great to go look at things through your binoculars when you're up on high on a building. So you really can use them for a lot of things. The things, the ones that I don't recommend are what they call these little pocket binoculars. They don't tend to be very good. They're usually, you know, $50, $60. And they're what they used to call opera binoculars, you okay. know, that you would take to the opera, the little tiny ones. They're okay, but they're not great. Okay. I think for, you know, just for a couple hundred bucks, um, that Vortex is a decent binocular. And you can use it for so many things, um, okay. not only for, for bird watching. And I think that um, it would be, the unfortunate thing is because everything now, all the purchasing of stuff is done online, many of what, we used to have camera stores. We don't even have camera stores anymore. And you, they used to carry binoculars and you can go and try out the different brands. But um, I would say um, there is a very good online um, company called Red Start Birding, which is the name of a bird. And they have um, a big price range in binoculars and everything they carry is very good. And I probably should have put that in the presentation. Um, but I was just trying to give everybody a general Thing. And, and you can go to Dick's um, Sporting Goods. They ha carry that vortex and see if see if they have it for you to look at. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't think there's any more questions. Does it and, look like it? Nah. So great presentation. And thank you again. Thank, and thank you for having me. And I hope to see you out there at the preserve sometime walking on the trails yes I, uh, you know now that you said that I, i'll go to the website to see when they all might right. have one okay okay all right have a good night everyone